Welcome to Science News. My name is Dr. Mary Cushman, and we are here to discuss the clinical science session that we just had here at, at Fall Sessions in Dallas on novel approaches to treating hypertensive disease and atherosclerosis. I'd like to introduce the discussants from that section, Dr. Keith Ferdinand, Dr. Bill Cushman, Dr. Zahi Fayed, and Dr. Bob Eckel. And I thought we would start by just discussing each study and having a little bit of conversation. So, Dr. Ferdinand, why don't you tell me about the Daylight trial that you discussed? Right, well, Daylight was the first trial. It was the study that looked at vitamin D and its effect on hypertension. The study was a negative study, a little bit uh, of a downer, because we know that there's observational data that vitamin D is directly related to an increase in blood pressure. However, we have not had prospective randomized trials to prove that supplement with a vitamin D type of medication would reverse the elevated blood pressure. So in daylight, they used ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Good study, well done. It did not show a benefit, taking it from about 15 nanograms per milliliter to up about 30, 31, 4,000 units versus 400 units. And so what do you think the implications are for the future um, of vitamin D interventions in blood pressure? Yeah, when the study was presented, it was suggested that this did not show a causal relationship between low levels of vitamin D and hypertension. My pushback was that there were some flaws. There was a lot of dropout, maybe as much as 28% of persons did not complete the trial. I also questioned whether or not the observed levels of vitamin D which were achieved would be therapeutic in terms of moderating the effects on blood pressure. Now we know the Institute of Medicine says 20 nanograms per milliliter, but they're talking mainly about preventing osteoporosis. If we're looking at preventing hypertension or treating hypertension, we may need higher levels than daylight achieved. Dr. Eckel, you, what did you think about the study? Well, I thought that the study was a little short-sighted in terms of mechanism. I'd like to see whether the vitamin D would have suppressed PTH. And we know this degree of vitamin D deficiency would be associated with mild secondary hyperparathyroidism. And we know that PTH has been implicated in terms of one of the factors can rate the higher blood pressure. We know that from patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, Dr. Wine claimed he has uh, serum in the refrigerator so uh, or the freezer, and he pre presumably can uncover that and measure PTH. But I think it may be interesting to see that those people who had a greater fall in PTH actually may have benefited, Keith, a little bit in the study, but those who didn't may not have. So That was one of the questions. Great. I, I think it's really good work and a good start in this direction to uh, future research on the topic. So, uh, Bill. You discussed the um, trial of dosing of aspirin in the time of day when it's given. So this was out of Leiden in the Netherlands, and the authors tested whether giving aspirin at bedtime might be better than giving it in the morning in terms of blood pressure levels and platelet reactivity. So what did you think of the study, and what were the big findings? Yeah, thanks, Mary. So there's some older studies that showed that aspirin given at bedtime would actually lower blood pressure uh, in younger people. Um, and so what this group did is they studied uh, aspirin in, in people who really should receive it for prevention purposes. Uh, and they compared giving it at bedtime versus in the morning and did a very nice sized ambulatory blood pressure monitoring study with almost 300 individuals um, and did not find any effect on blood pressure where those former studies had. They also looked at platelet reactivity and, and measured it in the morning uh, after the evening dose and compared it to the morning dose and showed some difference but absolute wise it was only about five percent difference um, so I think they uh, that's hypothesis generating perhaps that maybe people who are already taking aspirin maybe they might get some benefit taking it at night but we actually don't know the net effect of that it could actually be harmful to do that if it increased bleeding in some way so yeah I wondered about that you know I think um the idea of preventing those early morning coronary events mm -hmm. you know, might come at the expense of other issues. Mm -hmm. And I think to me the big question of this study was whether the difference they observed really would translate into a clini clinically meaningful difference in events. 
And so um, I had a nice discussion with the presenter mm. where we talked about ways they might look into that by maybe measuring other biomarkers or by um, doing some modeling approaches to, to seeing the translation. The, the present time, I think for most clinicians, we really are not sure that using platelet aggregation, those testing, translate into events. So I certainly wouldn't think it's ready now for prime time as a clinical recommendation. And just as Bill has suggested, there's always a question with that long degree of fasting state, whether you may actually increase gastric erosions or even bleed. Right, those are great points, really great points. So maybe a little too early to start telling our patients to take their aspirin at bedtime, uh, specifically, and I think more research is really needed to try to figure out what the, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think my assumption is that most studies actually gave aspirin in the morning, although that's hard to figure out. So the prevention data we have suggests doing that. So I think it is premature to change at this point. I thought one of the neat things in this trial was the uh, method they used to track compliance. They had electronic pill bottles that actually informed the, or they send a text to the participant if they miss their dose. And I thought that was really cool and maybe something to think about using in other settings to try to improve compliance. Uh, you know, totally separate really from the findings of the trial, but I, I thought that was intriguing. Okay. Did you want to say something, well, Dr. Eckel? I was Eichel? just going to comment on the platelet reactivity change by the intervention, meaning bedtime versus day, was so, so modest. And again, I agree with Keith, is that prime time kind of science, and I, or even potentially clinically applicable, likely not. It might be one of the disadvantages of a very well-powered study. You know, you can see these small differences, exactly. which may not be, be meaningful. Okay, so um, Zahi, you were the discussant for a trial of uh, Valsartan, and its impact on carotid artery atherosclerosis as measured by MRI. Uh, what did you think about that trial? Right, so this is the effervescent uh, trial uh, looking at angiotensin II type 1 uh, receptor blockade. Uh, they used non-invasive imaging uh, to, and the hypothesis was, uh, was with MRI, the hypothesis was that they wanted to see if there is any retarded progression or even regression uh, of the va vessel wall. Uh, they identified uh, patients uh, using um, also an IMT that there is some plaque, although um, the, the plaque in size in general was not very large in these patient population. These patients were subjected to, um, to carotid MRI, uh, and then they had several measures uh, uh, that has been shown in the past to be reproducible uh, related to, uh, to plaque size. Um, the, the study um, was, you know, showed, showed um, um, a decrease uh, in, the, in these parameters. However, the study opened up, I think, many questions and did not answer uh, the, the question that I think we were all interested in, in the aspect of the mechanistic aspect. You know, how is this happening? Why is this changing? There have been previous studies with similar type of, of, of classes of drug that did not show actually correlation with events, et cetera. So I'm not really sure what we can draw uh, from that trial. Uh, they also did some uh, secondary analysis related to biomarker aspect, looking at inflammation uh, such as CRP, as well as other measures of oxidative stress and vascular function. There was not much there. Uh, I, I was um, a little bit you know, disappointed. I wanted to see uh, further different uh, techniques that now are being used, such as plaque composition or plaque inflammation measurement directly at the local level rather than at the global level. Uh, so in general, yes, it's good that the study was done. It shows that the technology is actually good, but it didn't give me a lot of answers in that point of view. Yeah, I think the innovations in imaging are really exciting yeah. to allow us to design trials that can give us a real direction mm -hmm. and where to go because in terms of prevention, um, y you know, that's what we need to do. Atherosclerosis is the disease. The events occur, but if we can retard the atherosclerosis, we're going to have a great impact on prevention. Um, I have a question. See, yeah. Seeing it is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did mention, and, and in the study, they did not look at plaque composition. No, I know. But my question to you is perhaps unrelated to the study is plaque composition more important than plaque burden? Yeah, I mean, I think if we, if we look at the, the pathology, right, and the, and the study that had been done before, that definitely plaque composition is the determinant of the plaque that is prone to rupture and will rupture. So I think we know this from histopathology. But you're right that we don't have prospective studies 
to say this. But I, I believe it would be a more important parameter uh, than flag burden, most likely that would correlate with these events, yeah. Yeah, we, we published data years ago looking at carotid ultrasound yeah, and the absolutely. plaque characteristics uh, along with inflammatory markers. Yeah, yeah. And the, the plaques that are, are appear more unstable on ultrasound are associated with higher burden yeah. of inflammatory markers and higher risk of stroke. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's a really interesting area now with the advent of the, the more high-tech MRI yeah imaging of the plaque composition, there's really real promise for the future in that area. I mean, along these lines, I mean, there is data coming from Prospect, right, which was uh, intravascular imaging of the coronary artery uh, and showing and looking at, at subsequent events, as you know, and showing that, yes, the plaque composition or some of the features that are measured by this technique were, are, are more important predictors than just looking at the size of the vessel. Yeah. Great. So, Bob. You were the discussant uh, for a very interesting trial of the PCSK9 uh, antibody, AMG145, sorry. Evolacumab. 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 I can say that. Say I've been practicing. You know, I'm a hematologist, so I'm familiar with some of these Keith, OMABs. can you say Evolacumab? Evolacumab. Evolacumab. You want my microphone at this point? So I've had some practice over the years with, with, with the hematologic drugs. So why don't you tell us what, what the investigators reported in the Osler trial? Well, I think the major finding of the Osler trial is the fact that in an open-label study that you can continue Evolacumab therapy. This is a humanized monoclonal antibody against that new player in the atherosclerotic game, PCSK9, and you can effectively lower LDL cholesterol beyond standard of care by 50%. And that is a sustained effect occurring after one year. Now, they called this long term, and I must admit, I need to pause a second about long term being one year mm -hmm. in a disorder that you treat for life. It's kind of like you hypertension guys, right? I mean, you don't <laughs> treat hypertension for a year, right? You treat it lifelong. So I think we're, we're excited about the data, and we're also uh, ultimately concerned about potential adverse effects, but in this one-year study, there didn't seem to be anything really surface of significance. So the LDL cholesterol story gets more complex and interesting as we see some of these new compounds coming along that may effectively deal with two groups of patients. One, patients that are inadequately treated with statins, and we'll leave that open for further discussion. And the second group is statin intolerant patients, which by the way, there's a really substantial number of people that can't take evidence-based doses of statins. Four million. Yeah, well that's been approximated at four million people. So, in the US alone, right? We're talking about the globe now. So Keith, what did you think of the trial? I thought it was an interesting study. Uh, I would agree that it's not really long term when you're talking about a disease that's going to last for decades if a person's middle age and they live to 80, maybe three, four decades. The other thing that I was impressed was the lack of adverse reactions versus the uh, usual care group. Now it is an injection and we may want to discuss that. But looking at major adverse events, it didn't seem that there was anything really harmful going on. And it was really, they looked at people even with LDLs that got to a very low level. Didn't see anything bad. And, and he did make the point that the persons who were coming in with the active drug were seen more often. Mm -hmm. And we know in hypertension trials, the more you see patients, the more side effects you have. So I'm a hematologist, so I use a lot of uh, subcutaneously administered drugs. And I've always been actually surprised that the level of compliance is very good in my patients taking subcutaneous medications. Bob, maybe you want to comment on that. Well, I think the, the interesting data that were presented is after one year of continuous therapy, only one person quit taking the drug. And that's due to irritation at the injection site. This is not like giving you know, an exogenous protein where local reactivity would be expected. This is giving a humanized monoclonal. And the interesting thing he said was no antibodies were raised against this monoclonal antibody. But I think the volume of injection is, is somewhat large. This is three milliliters of subcutaneous administration. It's only given once a month. So if people really are statin intolerant and have heart disease, or alternatively have very high LDL cholesterols and heart disease or at high risk, they need an additional therapy, they're willing to inject three mils once a month, I think. And I, I was impressed. Yeah, that's quite a lot. Um, Bill, do you have ideas? Yeah, so I, I think we've had a lot of drugs that have looked safe and effective in relatively short term or even five or 10,000 patients. And it turned out to, to not be beneficial or to be harmful. Uh, I mean, this whole class is very exciting. 
and I think the degree to which it lowers LDL cholesterol is exciting, but we had the same enthusiasm about drugs that raise HDL dramatically. So I think, uh, I think it's reasonable to, to have drugs like this available, but with the, uh, the long-term trials going on that will show that it really is beneficial uh, and not harmful when you're looking at, at major cardiovascular outcomes in particular. Bill, you're in Dallas. This is LDL country down here, <laughs> not HDL country. <laughs> well, with that said, I, we had a really lively session. The house was packed here in Dallas, and I think the audience really enjoyed hearing about the trials. I think these trials, as a group, provide us incremental knowledge that will help get us toward our mission to really eliminate cardiovascular disease and stroke, uh, hopefully in our lifetimes. And you know we'll just keep plugging away in science to, to continue the good fight toward that, that end. And I'd like to thank you all for joining me today and, and all your hard work as a discussant in this session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah.